The Second World War was the deadliest and the most destructive global conflict in the human history, claiming the lives of more than 50 million people. It all started with Nazi Germany invading Poland on 1st September 1939 and Britain and France declaring war against Germany on 3rd September 1939 in retaliation to the invasion of Poland. On the same day, Viceroy Lord Lilith Goh's voice rang through the frequencies of All India Radio, announcing that His Majesty's government was at war with Germany and as a colony of that government, so was India. Thus, India was dragged into the war without its consent. This announcement sent a sense of rage among the Indian nationalists and they were not pleased to hear this. The Congress leaders were furious. India's involvement in the war had begun without the consultation of the Legislative Assembly or the Indian leaders. They were questioning how the British could drag Indians into the war without consulting them. Many viewed this declaration as an autocratic act by the British government. The British claimed that it was fighting for democratic freedom in the war. But how could the soldiers of India sacrifice their lives for upholding democratic rights while they were denied the same right? Isn't it so? The nationalist leaders were oscillating between different opinions. On one side was their hostility towards the Nazi operation, fascism and imperialism. On the other side, they wanted freedom for India. But the British were reluctant to take a definite stance on Indian aspirations for freedom. The Congress leaders were confused as to whether they should support the British or use this situation to secure our own independence. So a meeting of the Congress Working Committee was held between 10th to 14th September 1939 at Vardha to decide the official position of Congress. Here they sought the opinions of various parties, keeping in mind the nationalist tradition of accommodating diversity of opinions. At Vardha, the leaders expressed different opinions about the situation prevailing in India and worldwide. Subhash Chandra Bose and the socialists had voiced their active opposition to India's support to either of the two sides in the war. They argued that since both sides were fighting to protect their colonial territories or to gain more territories to colonize, the war was an imperialistic one. They believed that the INC should start working towards launching a civil disobedience movement, taking advantage of British weak stance and gaining their own independence. On the other hand, Mahatma Gandhi had openly expressed his sympathy for Britain. His reaction was highly emotional. This had much to do with his condemnation of fascist and Nazi regime. He was of the opinion that there was a clear distinction between the democratic states of Western Europe and the totalitarian Nazi state headed by Adolf Hitler. Jawaharlal Nehru did not prefer taking either of these stands. He was of the opinion that imperialism and fascism were two sides of the same coin. He condemned the fascist and Nazi doctrines and warned the world against the danger of these regimes that suppressed democratic values. Jawaharlal Nehru stated that India's sympathies were to be on the side of democracy and freedom and completely against the fascism and aggression. At the same time, he also opposed the imperialist nations that were fighting against the Nazis and fascists. He believed that the Second World War was a result of the internal contradictions of capitalism that had risen since the conclusion of the First World War. Then, what course of action did Nehru propose under such circumstances? Well, he held that non-violence had no place in defense against aggression and that India should support Great Britain 
in a war against Nazism. But only as a free country. If it could not help, it should not hinder. Nehru took a neutral stand and believed that India should neither join the war till it gained its freedom, nor should it take advantage of Britain's weakness and start a mass movement. Finally, after considering all the opinions, the Congress Working Committee adopted the official position at the Vardha session and passed a resolution that was drafted by Jawaharlal Nehru. The resolution condemned the German aggression on Poland. It asserted that a free and democratic India would gladly associate herself with other free nations for mutual defense against aggression. It also argued that if Britain was fighting for democracy and freedom, as they claimed, then they should prove it by freeing India and also ending imperial rule in its colonies. The resolution also asked the British government to state in explicit terms what their war aims were and how these aims were to be applied to India. The Indian nationalists wanted to give the Viceroy and the British government all the options for negotiations. And that is what they did. The INC tried to negotiate with the British and put forward their conditions in return for providing their support in the war. What were those conditions? Firstly, Congress demanded for the establishment of a constituent assembly post-war to decide the course of the political structure of free India and frame their own constitution. They also demanded that immediately some form of genuinely responsible government should be established at the center. Lastly, they also pushed for the participation of Indians in the war effort through representation in the Viceroy's Executive Council. Now, how did the British respond to these demands? Let's find out. The Viceroy, Lord Lilith Goh, rejected the conditions put forward by the INC. But Congress was adamant and argued that fulfilling those conditions was the prerequisite to win the support of the Indians in the war. At this point, the British could have easily won the support of Congress by fulfilling the conditions put forward by the Congress rather than rejecting it. However, they failed to do so and devoted all their attention towards winning the war. Instead of agreeing to the INC's demands, the Viceroy came up with a well-thought-out statement in which he vaguely stated the British policy towards India. He stated that the Government of India Act 1935 would be open to modifications at the end of the war in the light of Indian views but did not say anything about setting up of a democratically elected constituent assembly. He also assured minorities that full weightage would be given to their views and interests. He stated that at the end of the war, they would enter into consultations with representatives of several communities, parties, along with the Indian princes. This was to be done with a view of securing their aid and cooperation in the framing of modifications of the aforesaid act as it would seem desirable to them. For the time being, the Viceroy was prepared to constitute a consultative committee representing all the major political parties and Indian princes over which he himself would preside. And the advice of this committee might be sought on the issue of constitutional reforms for India after the war. However, the statement failed to declare Britain's political objectives. Even regarding the war aims, the Viceroy stated that the aim was to resist aggression. The government, thus as an immediate measure, in a carefully worded statement on 17th October 1939, offered to set up a consultative committee to look into the changes. Not just that, 
The Viceroy promised to look into the changes that were to be introduced to the Government of India Act 1935 after consulting with representatives of several communities after the war. Through this statement, Lilithgow also tried to instigate the Muslim League and the princes against Congress. And this came at a time when the political situation in the country was not very stable. There was a political deadlock between the two major political parties of India at the time, Congress and the Muslim League. The talks between both the parties were not fruitful. Consequently, they failed to make a headway. They had their own differences, but the major one arose when Muhammad Ali Jinnah did not want any conflict with the British government during the war, whereas Jawaharlal Nehru thought otherwise because of his anti-imperialist stance. Lilith Goh's statement brought out a mixed response among the major political parties in India. Congress was immensely unsatisfied with the statement, whereas the Muslim League welcomed it. The League President Muhammad Ali Jinnah assured Britain the support and cooperation of the Muslim League during the war. But this support came with a condition. What was that? Well, the Muslim League, in its resolution, passed on 18th October 1939, offered its support only if the Viceroy accepted the Muslim League as the only representative body of Indian Muslims. Meanwhile, on the same day, Lord Zetland, Secretary of State for India, spoke in the House of Lords and stated that there were differences among Indians, especially Hindus and Muslims. And also he branded Congress as a Hindu organization. Congress, particularly Gandhiji, who had advocated unconditional support towards Indian participation in the war, was very furious with these statements. He reminded everyone that the British government was resorting to the age-old divide-and-rule policy. Congress was very disappointed with Lilith Goh's statement. They were thus clear about Britain's intention of holding on to India as long as possible, even at the cost of treating Congress as an enemy. In the statement, the Viceroy refused to define Britain's war aims beyond stating that Britain was resisting aggression. It is sad to note that instead of clarifying their war aims, the government in fact confused Indians by adding fuel to the communal differences. The Congress Working Committee met on 23rd October 1939. In this meeting, they rejected the Viceroy's statement and decided not to extend the support to the British in the war. As a mark of protest, they asked their ministries in the seven provinces where they had a majority to resign immediately by passing a resolution. They also appealed to the people of the nation to sink all their internal differences. In response to the resolution, the Congress ministries in the provinces gradually started resigning one after the other. Jinnah, took this as an advantage to show Congress in poor light to further the League's interests. Jinnah even went ahead and announced that 22nd December 1939 should be declared as the Day of Deliverance and Thanksgiving to celebrate the resignation of the Congress ministries. Congress leaders criticized this move of Jinnah and also his claim of announcing the League as the sole representative of Muslims, while Congress also had Muslim leaders. Under such circumstances, Congress held its annual session at Ramgar in present-day Jharkhand on 18th to 20th March 1940, under the presidency of Maulana Abul Kalam Azad. The main agenda of this session was to decide the future strategy of Congress. In this session, Congress once again stated that India cannot directly or indirectly be a party to the war while still being denied freedom and democracy that the British stood for. Hence, Congress reiterated its demand that nothing short of complete independence would be accepted by the people of India. 
and also declared that they would resort to civil disobedience, but left all the major decision making of the movement to the personal discretion of Gandhiji. The Congress also demanded a new constitution, but their demands were in vain because the British government was in no mood to budge and consider the same. Amidst all this, the Congress leadership also had a big question that posed in front of them, whether or not to start an immediate mass movement. And sharp differences arose among the nationalists in this regard. Gandhiji and the other dominant leaders of Congress were not in favor of starting an immediate mass struggle. Firstly, they argued that the cause of the Britain and France fighting the war was just. Secondly, they believed that it was not the right situation to initiate a mass struggle given the situation of growing communal sensitivity in the nation. In the existing situations, mass movement could lead to communal riots. Lastly, and most importantly, they argued that people were not yet ready for a mass movement. Even Congress as an organization was not in a position to organize a mass movement. Under such circumstances, a mass movement would not be able to withstand the severe repressive measures taken by the government. Thus, they proposed to carry out political work among the masses. This would serve many purposes. It would tone up the Congress organization against its weaknesses. Also, it would prepare people for a mass struggle. And lastly, it would enable them to negotiate with the authorities till all possibilities of a negotiated settlement were exhausted to initiate a mass struggle. On the other hand, the dominant leadership of left-wing groups within Congress had an alternative view. They accepted all the existing challenges such as the weaknesses within the Congress organization. But they were of the opinion that masses were fully ready for the mass movement and waiting for a call from the leaders. Jawaharlal Nehru was unsure of the situation and was in a dilemma with regard to the question of a mass struggle. Although he realized the imperialistic motives of the Allies, he did not want to do anything that would lead to the victory of the Nazis either. Finally, he decided to go ahead with the opinion of Gandhiji and the majority of the Congress leadership. By this time, India had long buried the desire for home rule and she now wanted complete independence. Meanwhile, there were a lot of changes happening in Europe as well, and it was plunged into the war. In June 1940, the French troops faced a major defeat at the hands of the Nazi army. This made the English Channel and the Mediterranean Sea accessible to the Hitler's army. The position of Britain was not at all secured, and Britain was afraid that she might soon face the same fate. Thus, the British government was very keen on gaining Indian support for the war. The Congress Working Committee met at Delhi on 7th July 1940, where they passed an important resolution. Through this resolution, they put forward provisions for an immediate settlement contrary to their previous resolution and expressed their readiness to support the British war efforts. But this could only happen if its demand for an immediate and unequivocal declaration of complete independence was fulfilled. Along with it, they also demanded for setting up of a provisional national government at the center. The British, by this time, had the support of the Muslim League and several princely states. They were now keen to secure the support of Congress as well. The Britishers knew that a large number of people could join the army only if Congress supported them in their war efforts and appealed to the masses. So in return, the British government came up with a proposal called the August Offer. What were the terms and the conditions of this offer? Let's find out.
In order to win the support of the Indian masses and Congress for the war, the British government explained its stance on 8th August 1940. This document was later popularly known as the August Offer. This proposal stated that granting dominion status was the goal of British policy towards India. The term dominion was simply used for the nations that were independent but were not completely sovereign yet. Still confused? Let me simplify it for you. Let's look at an example for that. We all know that India attained its independence on 15th August 1947. And we also know that it became a republic on 26th January 1950. So, what was the status of India for these three years? Well, this was the phase when India had dominion status. We were, of course, independent, but without a ratified constitution of our own. Our constitution came into effect on 26th January 1950. Thus, we became a completely sovereign nation and our status changed from dominion to a republic. Moving on to the August offer. It also promised for the establishment of a constituent assembly, including indigenous representation and power to frame the constitution. The offer also provided the option for the extension of the Viceroy's Executive Council right away by inclusion of more Indians. Thus, for the first time, the council would have more Indians than the British. The Viceroy also declared the establishment of an advisory war council, which would also have representation from Indian states. The August offer also talked about the provision to include the consent of minorities on matters related to the constitution. It assured them veto power, which meant that now no constitutional provision could be adopted without the consent of minorities. Well, all these provisions would be implemented only after the end of the war, that too only if Britain was supported in their war efforts. This time, the British had pushed the Indian nationalists too far. Let's have a look at how they reacted. We will start with Congress' reaction to the offer. Undoubtedly, for Congress, the offer was nothing but an utter disappointment. And they felt that the offer was ridiculously out of place for a country like India who had been demanding for complete independence. They did not appreciate the offer for the simple fact that it was offering only the dominion status. Jawaharlal Nehru remarked that the whole concept of dominion status for India was as dead as a doornail. And also the Congress, in its resolution passed in the Lahore session in 1929, had accepted Poon Swaraj as its goal. Congress thus decided to reject the August offer. Thus, it appears that the war crisis widened the gap between the British imperialists and the Indian nationalists. As Gandhiji rightly put it, Criticizing this offer, he said that it widened the gulf between Indian nationalists and the British. It was clear that the British government was not ready to give up their power. And they were just making the issue of minorities an unconquerable barrier on the path of India's march towards freedom. On the contrary, the offer clearly encouraged the division on communal lines. Hence, one would expect the Muslim League to appreciate and accept it, which they initially did. They were glad that the offer proposed a veto power to the minorities in framing the constitution. But they had their concerns. By the time the League began to demand a separate state of Pakistan and were convinced that it was the only solution to break the political deadlock. Not being satisfied with the Viceroy's offer, even the Muslim League rejected the offer. Even though the August offer was a failure, 
still it had a lot of significance in the Indian independence movement. Well, it was for the first time that the British recognized the right of Indians to frame their own constitution. For decades, Congress had been demanding for the setting up of the Indian Constituent Assembly and the British government finally conceded. However, it was not going to come to fruition until the end of the war. The proposed Constituent Assembly was supposed to have the representation of the Indians. The British government for the first time agreed to give the responsibility mainly to the Indians to draft their constitution, which was a good move. Apart from that, the British government unequivocally offered dominion status to India. But complete independence was the goal of Congress, not the dominion status. And they were not going to give up their pursuit until achieved. 